joystick that was released with the Atari 5200. Um, as you can see, you have a numerous keypad similar to the Intellivision and the ColecoVision, which was the thing of the day. Um, we have two fire buttons on each side. We have start, pause, and reset buttons at the top. And then Atari felt that this here, which is an analog joystick, it's analog, left, right, up, and down. It is non-centering, but it is analog. So they felt that there's no need to make a paddle because just like with a paddle where you're turning it, you can simply move the joystick left and right or up and down depending on the game to give you the fast reaction times. I mean, in all honesty, uh, playing a game like Breakout or Kaboom like this is very different than if they had built in uh, a potentiometer, which like the Bally Astrocade had done, which was kind of neat. I always thought that's what this was because it turned, but it's just the way they made the shaft. So Atari never released anything uh, really specifically for games like the built-in game Breakout. So this was the controller you had to use when you first bought your Atari to play Breakout. And uh, it's not really that good. So what you can do is if you have an old controller like I have right here. Now this is not my design. I have a link down below to the gentleman on YouTube where I got the, the way to build this. But this was a completely non-functioning Atari 5200 controller. None of the buttons were working on it at all. I cleaned up all the corrosion on all of them. Still didn't work. But I have a video where I do show you how it's very easy to fix these. And now this thing's working great. All the buttons work on here. And I had an old broken Atari 2600 paddle. So I took the potentiometer out. Put it in here. And used the uh, paddle top. And this really works great. For a breakout, kaboom. Uh, this is a great, great controller. The one downside is uh, games like Pole Position not only use the left and right. Which again, you could do here on the original controller. But... To shift gears up and down wasn't any of the other buttons. To shift up and down, you had to actually move your joystick up and down. So when you do this initial modification to make a paddle, there's no way to shift up and down because the first potentiometer, which is the lower potentiometer in this unit, becomes your paddle. The upper potentiometer, which would be your up and down controls, is removed completely. So there's no way to shift up and down. But again, for games like uh, Breakout and Kaboom, this thing is really, really good, especially if you have some old broken controllers. Uh, my, I will put a link down below to my video on how to create this. And it's a really nice controller. I do like the feel. It looks like it was built by Atari. It's probably what they should have done. But in this video here, I'm talking about my version 2 of my paddle controller, which is this guy right here. Now, what's different about this one is uh, I didn't have any extra uh, Atari 2600 paddles. So I went down to my local Radio Shack and tried to find parts uh, to make one. Now again, this was a completely non-working joystick. I don't try to I try not to ruin anything that's you know working. This was got off eBay, just like the one next to it. Nothing worked out, none of the buttons. And again, my technique got this thing working again, brand new. Uh, all the buttons work, five buttons work, and everything. Um, but again, I didn't have anything from my old paddle. So you can see here, um, it still looks really good. And to be honest. I think I actually like this better, this size knob versus the big Atari 2600 paddle. Um, this is still good, don't get me wrong, it's still good, uh, works great, I'm used to it from my Atari days, but something about this one makes me feel more like the older uh, Pong games, and it just kind of, I don't know, a little more nostalgic as far as that goes, but you can see again, like the uh, 2600 paddle, the uh, knob here I got at Radio Shack fits in really nice, uh, it actually fits in a little bit better because the uh, potentiometer you buy from them is a long shaft, you have to cut it. So I cut it down to length, and um, it works really well. But this has the addition of being able to work with pole position. You're like, how is that possible? Well, very simple. Look onto the side here, and I've added a switch. So this switch is actually wired to the where the lower potentiometer would have been. It has a resistor, so it's got low gear and high gear set up on this. Again, this is not my design. I'll put a link down below. It's the same gentleman whose design I got for uh, this one here, but uh, you don't have to ruin anything more than a non-working 5200 controller, which there are a lot of these around. And uh, you just buy a couple parts, I'll put the link down below to all the parts. It's not too expensive at all, and you can build yourself a really nice working uh, 5200 uh, paddle controller. Now what I'll say is that the uh, potentiometers in the 2600 paddles are a little bit, uh, I want to say lighter to the touch. So I'm going to call this, if you're driving a car, your standard mode. The potentiometer, maybe because it's new, these are a little more firm, so I'm going to call this your sport mode, but um, it doesn't detract from it all, and again, I'm, I'm thinking I like the feel of this one better than this one, um, but let's get into some of the gameplay, so I'll show you how it, uh, how it works. Again, it's not hard to make, uh, it does require uh, some soldering skills uh, and a, a way to cut down the shaft on here, but again, I'll explain that later on in this video. 
But now let me show you how you can make your own. Again, I want to just note that the design was not mine. I have a link down below to the gentleman who made the original version that I created my paddles from. I made some small changes uh, to his design for my own, but if you want to see his videos, the link is down below. Uh, you can see over here, this is my original uh, paddle controller. And um, it's basically you take an Atari 2600 paddle and you take the potentiometer out and the, the knob and an old uh, 5200 controller and you make this. Now, if you want to see how I made this particular paddle, I do recommend you look at the video because I do go in depth on how to disassemble and repair the controller. Um, it works quite well. Um, again, uh, this was a non-working 5200 controller and a uh, busted up paddle. They were able to make a hybrid. Now, for games like Breakout and uh, Kaboom, this is a must-have. Uh, you can play it with a joystick, but it's just not the same moving a joystick left and right than rotating a paddle. And again, if you were, uh, had a 2600, the feel of the paddle, uh, it's going to feel exactly like that. Uh, the one downside to this design uh, is that uh, although it works great for a Breakout and uh, Kaboom, if you want to play pole position, there's an issue. And the issue is uh, when you make this modification, you take a potentiometer out of a 2600 paddle and you're replacing the lower potentiometer in the 5200 joystick. And that gives you your, your left and right. Then the problem comes in when you want to shift your gears in pole position. The pole position does not use any of the buttons for its shifting. Instead, your joystick up and down is your shifting from high to low gear. Now, uh, I didn't realize that when I made this paddle initially. So this again is great and I may modify it, uh, what I'm gonna show you now to this paddle. But um, right now, this is really not gonna be used for pole position, but it works great for breakout and other games like that. So the other thing was I didn't have any paddles um, uh, to take parts from. Uh, I had one potentiometer that was broken and one that worked from a broken plastic uh, 2600 paddles. And I didn't wanna butcher any other ones. And I didn't feel like buying um, parts and best electronics and, and waiting to get them in the mail, although they're very good and very quick. Uh, there was still a Radio Shack by me. I wanted to go down and see if any parts I can get from there uh, to make one. And this is what I came up with by going to my local Radio Shack. And this is how it turned out. And I'm gonna be honest, I think I like this uh, more than the uh, one with the 2600 paddle. Um, this here, uh, I would make it a comparison to like a, a new car with its normal driving mode, how it feels as far as its uh, softness and rotation. This, I'm gonna make it more of like a sports car. It's a little bit firmer. And there's just something about this knob that reminds me of the old classic Pongs that you would get from like Coleco or Telstar and Atari. And I think it actually looks really nice. I, I do like how it looks. I definitely like how it feels. And it made one addition. Uh, this again is the lower potentiometer I'm stealing the wires from, but over here uh, I added a resistor and a switch that'll connect to the upper potentiometer for my high low gears for pole position, which is what this video is all about. So I uh, went on eBay and I got a non-working uh, 5200 joystick. And again, um, if you want to know how to fix these, again, I go more in depth in my first video on the paddle controller, the link down below, you might want to take a look at that. I do talk about it again towards the end of the video. This was not working, and sure enough, when I got it, uh, not a uh, single one of these buttons worked. None of these buttons worked up here either, but the potentiometer itself did work for the up and down. Now, the issue mostly is um, there is corrosion that builds up on the flex circuit, and it's easy to clean with an eraser and some alcohol, but I find more so that the carbon dots used on the buttons themselves are more the culprit. And again, we'll discuss that more a little bit later in the video. So right now, what I'm gonna do is pry off the top uh, part of the uh, controller. And the best thing to use is a plastic extraction tool. You can use a screwdriver or a knife, but they may gouge the plastic. What I generally do is put a plastic extraction tool right about here, pry it up enough, to get a flathead screwdriver in. Then I pop here. You can see that's where it's connected to here. Pops here, pops here, and it comes right off. Now you can clean all this stuff up with some soap and water. And then in the back of the controller, again, uh, if you want more detailed information and a, sl a slower progress of these steps, please look at my first video linked down below on my Atari original paddle controller. But we're going to pull these four, uh, three screws out here, put a flathead screwdriver down here to pry this apart. And I start down here because there's two plastic um, shafts here that go in. You don't want to bend and break them if you open it from the back. Just start with a screwdriver here. Once these pry open, it'll come off nice and easy. As you can see, everything here is pretty clean. This flex circuit's gonna need some TLC. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, and the two potentiometers here, they're actually held in with a little bit of glue. Uh, most of the, I found uh, the glue's dried up and they kind of shake. You just 
grab it and twist it a little bit and it come right out. But in this one, this one did not want to come out. The glue was really good. So I just had a small screwdriver I got in here and I pried under it just enough to loosen the, the glue to get it out. So you can see here's another shot of it. Now on the wire harness, you can see there's a brown wire and a black wire. That's going to be used for your steering, your left and right on the new potentiometer, whether it's a uh, paddle controller from a 2600 or the one part down below I got from Radio Shack listed. Uh, and then the upper potentiometer here is, uh, again, the black wire is the ground, so that goes between these two, and it's going to be the red wire. Now this red wire and black wire is going to go to a switch over here with the resistor, and that'll be our high-low gear. So again, uh, when you're taking out the flex circuit, uh, you can see over here and over here, there's usually some double-sided sticky tape. Just be careful uh, when pulling it out. Generally, I would put a plastic uh, extraction tool back here to pry it off or a very, uh, be very careful if using a butter knife or anything else. I wouldn't recommend pulling on it because you can you know, damage these, uh, these circuit wires in here. But just be very careful pulling the wire off uh, the, the, uh, the plastic tape here and here. Now, this pulls in and pushes in. It's not a zip circuit uh, socket where you have to like pry this up. This wire will just come out when you pull on it or push in when you push back in on it. But there is a plastic tray down here that has uh, three uh, posts. So I just take a small flathead and I pry here, 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 and here to pull this out and it comes right out of this uh, wire harness right here, no problem. The next thing is, again, I, the uh, glue, like I said, on some of these are very loose. This one came right out, no problem. This guy was more difficult. Just take your time, loosen the glue, you know, get under it and it'll crack a little, in a little bit, but it'll should come out okay. Just be careful you don't damage your wires. Again, we're gonna need the brown wire, the black wire, the black wire continued, and the red wire. Those are the ones we're going to be concentrating on. Now, uh, it's also a good time when you take this all apart, take your plastics, go with some Dawn, and clean them all up with some soap and water. Now, on the top of the joystick, uh, I've seen some people just rip these out. You don't need to do that. Just put a post-it note around the plastic uh, shaft on the inside here, just so you don't damage it with a pair of pliers when you grip it. Once you have a good grip on this end, just give us a couple of twists, and this will pull apart nice and easy, and you can save all the components. Now, the next thing is the, uh, the boot that does have to come off. And this is a photograph from my first uh, paddle controller. Uh, I couldn't get it, and I actually snapped it. But that's okay. It's not going to be used anymore. But if you take your time, you can get a small screwdriver in these four spots, and it'll pop out uh, these little lock spots, and you won't damage your ring, and you can save your boot. But again, these are not going to be used anymore for the paddle controllers. Now, this flex circuit uh, did have some uh, damage on it. Uh, there were some breaks in the traces. So what I did was I took a uh, small X-Acto knife and just scraped off the upper protective coating around the brakes, put down some flux in the spots where there were brakes, and resoldered them, and tested continuity, and they're working fine. So you can see it's a little shiny in these two spots where I had to uh, take off some of the coating and resolder, and also all these spots right here are resoldered as well. But again, you can see it right here. I cleaned these up with just an eraser and some rubbing alcohol, so all the traces were good and just repair these traces right here, here, and up here with, uh, again, just scraping off very gently. You have to be very careful. You don't want to scrape away the actual wire, but just be very gentle. Scrape off nice and easy. Put some flux down, and you can resolder your joints and save a circuit. That would have been garbage otherwise. And this is a, just another shot of these spots I needed to repair. Now, when working on the uh, the top half of your controller, there's one of two things you can do. Uh, the original video I saw, he got a washer and he placed it inside here. Um, I decided I wanted to go in the outer ring just because I felt that this is probably strong enough, but I just felt this would be even stronger, just my preference. You, you may want to do it his way. But whether you go in this area, in this side uh, of the ring, or this ring, whatever washer you get, you're going to have to shave some of it off of it. Now, they're just a little bit too big, they won't go in. So you're going to need a rotary zip, or a grinding tool and just go around and grind off the edges. Take your time, it won't take too long. Um, it gets very hot, so either be like me, constantly blowing your fingers or get a pair of gloves as you grind it. Um, and then you can put it right in here. It'll sit in nice and tight and snug. Again, uh, my original paddle controller, I went out here, but I left this in place. And this particular one, I still went on the outside, but I shaved this off just to make the washer sit down lower. Again, it was just a preference. I think I, I'll do that from now on, just shave this off and, and go to the outer ring. Now here's an original paddle controller uh, from the, this is the second one from the paddle I stole the potentiometer from for my first video. And you can see the shaft is broken, so I couldn't use this. 
Uh, this was actually one I got originally. I wasn't paying attention. I got a 5K ohm uh, potentiometer, and the paddle did not work. It's got to be at least a 500K ohm, which is what this one is. I'm sorry, this one's a 1 mega ohm. Uh, this is a 1 mega ohm in the original paddle, so I got a 1 mega ohm. I couldn't find a 500 mega ohm, which is the fi what the 5200 used originally, but that's fine. It still works just no problem. The only difference is um, when you rotate your paddle, um, this will rotate quicker than it would with the 5200s, and that's fine. I like the quicker reaction time with it. So this is a 1 mega ohm uh, potentiometer, just like the 2600s, uh, 1 mega ohm potentiometer. This one was no good. It was only 5K, and it was just a dud. So you can see here, um, this is how they come from Radio Shack. You're going to have to cut some of it off it. I don't give a dimension here because it totally depends on what type of knob or what you want to do with it. But I just eyeball it anyway. And I just cut it right off. Uh, with a rotary zip or rotary tool, it's very easy to do uh, by just splicing it right across the top. So again, it's just another angle of the uh, potentiometer uh, showing the, the three spots. We only need two of them. One of them is not going to be used. And again, just another angle. And this knob you want to leave on. I'll show you why in a second. Um, it comes in pretty handy, actually. Okay, so you got your washer in place, and you're going to put this in. You see that little nub? It actually fits right here well. I know it looks like I kind of gouged it, but I really didn't. This might have still been hot from when I when I cut it off uh, the top. But it actually locks in spot, the spot really well here, which will keep the potentiometer from rotating left and right. And, of course, your screw will keep it from you know moving in or, or out of the unit. But it fits in there perfectly like a glove. It works really, really nice. You can see it sits right in there. And that'll keep the potentiometer locked in place really, really well. And that's it. It's locked in place. So uh, I soldered two smaller wires on just to give me more, more room to work with. The wires in the harness are not going to be long enough, I don't think, to uh, come all the way out and work comfortably. So the black wire is my ground, so that's what this wire is going to be. I know this is green, but this will actually be our brown wire. Soldered here, and this one's not used. So black goes here, and your brown is going to go here. And again, you can see what this looked like before it was cut. I put it in place, and you can see... The original 2600 potentiometer would screw would come up to about here so these actually sit lower it's just enough it's just enough to lock in spot with its washer and then my washer down here which is now sitting nice and low and uh i like it hope you guys do too so you see i just eyeballed it i came i just basically cut off uh right here i just marked a spot eyeballing it and just chopped that right off and that's what it looks like when it's cut it goes very easily it's just aluminum and it's, uh, it comes off really easy. Another angle. And that's how it sits with the knob. Now, I do like the paddle controller knob on the 2600. But I like this one, too. Um, I like how it's sitting here. You have contrast of black and, and the chrome with the washer in there. But this knob just feels really nice in the hand. And, and the rotation, uh, again, feels a little firmer, but I, I like it. Um, the uh, knob I got here, I like, too. It reminds me of the old, like, Coleco... Uh, Telestars or the old Atari Pong knobs. Um, so again, it's personal preference. You can use whatever you like, uh, but this part will be listed down below in the comments. And again, just another angle. You can kind of see it kind of flows here. It comes up and it comes across enough, so it just looks nice. I like it. Again, another angle. And this is how this is held in place. There's a, uh, a flathead screw. So you just put it on the shaft, turn that, and it locks in place, and it. it holds on really really well now if you want you could always flatten one part of the, uh, the shaft to make sure it really sticks but it's really not necessary and again just another angle it just again it just flows really well with that I like how that turned out now on the inside we want to put a button you can see here's the old glue residue um, from the potentiometers now here is where your flex circuit would sit and there's another uh, piece of plastic behind it um, so when we're working with the switch, this one, you see how to cut off. So there's one here, one here. This is where the flex circuit sits, but the back one has to be cut out. Um, I cut it down low. In the original video of the gentleman who did it, he didn't cut it as low, and he put his button right in the middle. I didn't want to do that because if you put the button right in the middle, you have to cut this out of your uh, fire button area. I didn't want to do that. I wanted the button or the switch to come in an existing hole and not cut this apart. So I cut it lower number one to put it down here but also when you have your wire come in um, if you put it in the middle here 
um, when you go to um, bring your wire in, you got to have it underneath. And if you put your wire underneath, uh, you have to remove the whole screw and switch if you ever have to change your wire harness. By putting it down low, the wire harness does just fit over the top. And if you ever need to change your wire harness, you can without removing your switch. So you can see here is a switch. Again, of the part number down below. Uh, what I did was I simply put my button uh, piece back in, went right in the center of the lower hole to make my marking for my, uh, my switch. And you can see it's numbered one, two, three. It'll make it easier for us to go through and, and put our wires on and put a resistor in place. So you can see here, I simply put the plastic in place so I knew where to drill through for my, uh, for my switch. I went dead center for it. And then what I'm going to do is I'll cut this off here so I have a button. Now the button technically could work when you put your flex circuit back in. If you're very careful and cut between the flex circuit, you can put the top button to make that working again. Again, that was not done in, in this one. Um, that's right now a non-working uh, button. But here's another angle. You can see how it fits in. Now, when you mount the switch, you got to put the switch through the hole to lock the nut. This you kind of have to bend in place. It's kind of tricky. Um, but it can be done. I basically just turned it like 90 degrees, put it on top, and then pushed it in and it went in and it's locked in place. So it sits in really well. But it's something you don't want to keep pulling in and, and putting out, which is why I put the switch low. So the wiring harness is above it. So this never has to be touched again once it's in place. So here's the switch. We have a one, two, three. Number one will be our black ground wire. Number two will be the, the upper potentiometer's red, uh, red wire here. And you can see we have a resistor. I have the information down below on the resistor. But you can see the color coding, how it's going to sit. So the resistor goes to ground here and to the other part on the three on the, number, on the switch. And just soldered it in place. And that's all you need to do. So when you flick the switch in the two positions, it'll go from high, as if your joystick's up high, and then switch it low. It's like you pull the joystick down low. Again, just another angle, just so you can see the colors and how it comes in. I like taking lots of photographs so you can see, but I really want to sit, have a lot of pictures so you guys don't have any questions on you know how it's connected or wired. I want you to see it from all different kinds of angles. And this is from the underside. This is one, this is two, this is three. And you can see I put it right through the hole. I locked it in place and put a little uh, Loctite on the nut so it doesn't have to come off. The uh, wire harness will now sit right above it. It's a little snug but it's not so snug that it's a problem. And uh, my black wire, which is my ground, the center, which is my red wire, and number three is the other part of my resistor here. Again, another angle. You can see I went down nice and low, so it'll still fit through the original button area. Again, just want to give you guys more uh, viewing angles just so you can kind of see how everything sits now once this was in place I made sure this was nice and level and again I put a little Loctite just to keep this in in place you can use hot glue as well um, but I just happened to have Loctite available my glue gun was kind of empty but you can see why this has to be cut out so it can sit down nice and uh, low in the area and allow the wire harness to basically go right above it Again, another angle here, uh, seeing how it sits nice and low. Just make sure it's flat so your switch goes straight across, doesn't go on you know, on, a, on an angle. So I decided to twist that a little bit to get it uh, level. And you can see, uh, once the switch is in place, you can basically come over it and then put one end in the slot. And then you're going to have to kind of like bend it, just a smidgen to get it in. But once, it's, once you start it, just push down, it'll lock in place and sit and hold this whole thing in, in the area nice and tight. So here's the button that I cut. Again, it's, I guess it's possible to cut your flex circuit and keep this upper button active. Um, but for right now, that's something that I'm not uh, doing in this particular one. Maybe there'll be a version three joystick in the future. Um, but the button is just pushed here uh, just to fill in the other hole to make it not look empty. So here you can see the wire harness now put back in place. And you can see it does go right over the switch. 
um, if you put the switch more in the center like the original uh, gentleman did in his video which again the link is down below um, this wire harness will have to go underneath and then if you ever have to replace your wire harness it's gonna be a pain getting in and out this way it does go on top it does fit uh, just fine it's, uh, it's snug snug is good won't come out but you can see the wire harness is back in place we have our brown and black wire which would be our left right potentiometer movement and then this other black wire and the red wire here will go to here for our high low for our gear shifting and pole position you can see the wire goes right over and it'll fit just fine so you can see we're starting to do the rewiring i got the flex circuit back in place I didn't you know you can cut this I didn't want to I simply bent it around to, keep, to get it out of the way in case I ever need it for another modification um, I tested all the buttons everything's working here okay and we'll get into how I repaired the carbon dots in a moment so you can see we start to do wiring and uh, it's always good to buy some um, heat shrink tubing as well but you can see our brown wires coming in and now goes to my green wire which is our center on the potentiometer the black wire comes up in here and goes to the uh, upper spot on our potentiometer. The red wire comes all the way down. We're going to zoom in here so we can see it a little bit better. The red wire comes around and goes to our center pole on our switch. And the black wire, again, is, it comes in two spots. It continues along here and goes to the upper. And once you test it, make sure everything's working. Just heat the heat shrink tubing to shrink it down to make sure you have no shorts inside the uh, system. Again, just another angle. We'll zoom in on that again. And again, I marked this one. It's a one meg ohm. This is the exact same uh, type of potentiometer that's in the 2600 paddle. Uh, the 5200 potentiometers are 500K. But again, this will work just fine. It'll just give you a quicker reaction time because it's basically when you are going right to left, this will do it in half the time that these would. So it actually, I think it's better using that one mega ohm versus a 500 mega ohm potentiometer. But again, the brown wire comes in, goes to green to center. Black wire comes across, goes to upper. Black wire comes out again. And we're going to pull this down a little bit. Black wire goes all the way up to the top. Our red wire comes all the way around to the middle. And we have our resistor here. So now the next thing is to do is to try and get these buttons to work. Um, again, these generally do need to be cleaned. Uh, they get a little corrosion on them. The eraser and some um, rubbing alcohol takes care of them. But I'm finding more and more, it's not the issue here so much. I mean, they do need to be cleaned, but it's actually the carbon dots on the buttons themselves. So again, in my first video, if you haven't taken a look at it, please go back there. I described using some um, aluminum tape that they use for duct work with like central air units. I find that works very well. So here are the carbon dots. Uh, none of these are working. Not one of these buttons were working. So what I do is I take a, a very small dot of crazy glue. I mean, not a lot. I'm talking about a very tiny dot. Because you use too much, it's just going to push out in the sides. The smallest dots you can get, I do one at a time. Put a little drop of crazy glue on all of these. Then I cut small pieces of that aluminum tape, which is also adhesive in itself. Um, you probably don't need the, the crazy glue, but why have a problem later on? So between the adhesive that's on here and the crazy glue, these should never come off. And then once you have them on, I kind of just press around it to make sure these indent in versus indent out, just to make sure there's no accidental button presses in any of them. Uh, you don't have to be perfectly exact. Uh, you see I'm not here, but it doesn't really matter. The contact will be made if, if, as long as you're close. And again, some crazy glue just keeps them in place. And what I do is I turn them back over. And then once I do that, I press down on all of them for one or two seconds just to make sure that the adhesive and the crazy glue bond really well to those carbon dots. Then you can basically put your controller back together. And before you put the screws in, I tested all the buttons and every one of these buttons were working. Uh, and the potentiometer is now working now that I put in the right one. The original time I, I put it together, I only had a 5K ohm, which was not sufficient and I got no readings from it at all. But now this is a one mega ohm Radio Shack uh, potentiometer and it works really well. Here's just another angle again. You can see the controller just prior to testing how it looks and I, I really do like the looks I'm telling you I like how it feels too uh, this is slowly becoming my favorite now 
I'm going to be hate to, to be giving this away, but this one is actually going to be given to the Atari 5200 podcast. Um, and I uh, hope he'll be happy with it. I th I'm very happy with it. I hope he will be too. So here it is all sealed up and uh, ready to try. So I'm just going to give you some different angles of the controller at this point, just so you can see how everything kind of fits together. Here's obviously the top down view, a slight angle view on the controller. You can see here the switch is now in the upper position. And again, that rotary knob really flows nice. I'm really happy with that. I, I love it. Uh, and the switch is nice and centered as well. In the upper, now in the lower position. Okay, let's see how this works. Let's give it a try. Okay. So here is uh, Super Breakout. This was the included game uh, back in the day with the 5200. Uh, my version is the version 4 port 5200. And um, here is the version 2 of my paddle controller. Now, if you want to see the gameplay on the original paddle controller I made, uh, the link down below to that video. Now, a little note on this. When you do connect this controller to games like Breakout or Kaboom, the uh, switch over here, which is your up and down uh, potentiometer, must be in the up position for these games. If it's in the lower position, for some reason, the 5200 doesn't recognize it, or basically the paddle in, in, in this game won't appear on the screen at all. So just make sure the switch is in the upper position, turn on your 5200, and you won't have any problem with the unit working. So we'll hit the start button here, and let's try it out. You can see the paddle is here. Now, again, if this was on the down position when I turned it on, the paddle you see here would simply not be here. It'd probably be off screen somewhere for some reason. But just put it in the up position when you turn it on, you'll be okay. So let's give it a shot. I'm trying to get it so you guys can see me playing it uh, and me see it as well. So here we go. Now, the, again, uh, I'm going to make this uh, statement about this particular potentiometer. It's like a sport mode. It's a little, I don't want to say firmer, but you can see it tracks very well. Uh, but it's got a nice feel as far as I'm concerned. I think it feels really nice. Uh, the uh, 2600 paddle controller seems very light. I'm sure most of us are used to that. But uh, I do like the feel of this here. It's almost like buying a, uh, an Audi versus a, maybe a Ford, um, uh, Ford Edge or something like that as far as the paddle goes. But it's got a really good feel to it. And you can see it tracks very, very well. And you're not using an older potentiometer. Again, there's nothing wrong with using the ones from the old paddle controls if you have one available. If it's like the whole like plastic is broken like mine was. But um, even that with the years, even when you clean it, they don't track always perfectly. And when you have a brand new one like this, um, it really makes a difference. And I really like how this one feels. And it was not difficult to make at all. So we've seen the gameplay here now on uh, Breakout. Let's try doing what I made this control for, which is pole position. So let's give that a try. Now, I just want to make a little uh, note, if you will. Um, I don't have a pole position cartridge. Uh, the one I had is not working. I'm trying to clean it. It's still not working. I'm not sure what's going on with it. But I do have an Atari Max. So that's what's in right now. And what I noticed is when you use the Atari Max version of pole position, again, it's not really Atari Max's issue, but when you load the ROM, um, it first seeks or tries to find, for some reason, I guess a roller controller. Atari designed it to work with a roller controller as well. And what happens is, when you load it this way, uh, since it's trying to find a trackball, something must not reset in the 5200, and the car will only go left. No matter what you do, the car is stuck in the left position. So I did a little search on Atari Age, and I'll put a link down below, where they made a ROM available that it does not search for the, for the trackball, and then it works perfectly fine. Again, it's nothing wrong with the modification to the controller. It's just the, when the Atari Max loads the initial ROM, something doesn't reset in 5200. So the ROM is pretty easily available. And I actually made a folder here. Uh, if I could find it without my glasses, I'm getting a little blind. Uh, I made a, there was pole position. I stopped right on it. So I have a folder called pole position and pole.bin. When I load this particular game, it works just fine. Now, you have to initially use your joystick to make the selection. Uh, I'm hoping to make a version three paddle where I may put in some type of controller so you can pick games without having to swap controllers. But for right now, I do need to swap it over to my paddle controller. Uh, running on the 5200, and currently I installed my original paddle. I just want to show you that it does work, there's just no way to shift gears. So let's start the game. You see my gas works, I can steer the car left and right.
but I'm in currently in high gear and I can't shift it. There's nothing I can do. Yeah, it still doesn't uh, affect my driving ability. <laughs> but you can see it does work. There's just no way to shift it. So let's now connect the version 2 paddle and play this game how it should okay, be played. Okay, so here's pole position now. And I've installed my version 2 paddle controller with my shifter, which is now in the low position right here. So let's start the game. Okay, I'm in low gear. And I'm going to go and flip to my high gear. And it works really well. Just for giggles, back to low gear. And back to high gear. Oops. So this was not hard to build at all. It works really, really well. There we go. So that's it. Um, again, this will work with Breakout and Kaboom as well, but as the added benefit with this switch to have your gear shifting for pole position. So that's it. It's not too difficult to make. I do hope you enjoyed the video. And again, if you haven't seen it first, look down below in my comments field to find the video of my original Atari Paddle Controller. Again, thanks for watching. Thank you all to my current subscribers. And if you did like this video and you're not currently, please consider subscribing, liking, and also leave any comments down below because I do read them. Again, all the parts for the second version of the Paddle Controller is available at your local Radio Shack. It's not too difficult to do, and I really think if you have an Atari 5200, you really should give it a try, because it really does make these games a lot better to play. Again, thanks for watching, everyone, and game on.